Suso, tira Alessio, Suso, tira, perché non tiriamo? Ma perché non tiriamo? Gol! Alessio Romagnoli, gol! Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Sempre Milan podcast. I'm your host, Oli Fisher. You can find me on Twitter at Oli Fisher. Joined once again by Anthony Torgrud, rocking the backwards cat, like him. Yeah, I just uh, changed it up. Uh, my, my quarantine hair is a little out of control, as shown on my face here, and uh, just needed to cover it. But yeah, glad to be back. Follow me on Twitter at Torgrud45. Uh, Madison, your hair looks good today. Thanks, I showered this morning. I sh- oh. you know, so Big change I present myself. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't shower yesterday morning, and Shannon gave me a real hard time about how I looked in a meeting. She goes, you went to your meeting like that? And I was like, I'm working from home. You know, it's cool. Apparently not. Uh, so, yes, go ahead and follow me on Twitter at Madison underscore DT. Yeah, the other yeah. day, I actually had a, a meeting on Zoom as well for, for my job, and I just put on, like, a nice top, and I didn't have pants on. <laughs> it was great. Nice. I had pants on today, though, because I had to leave the house. Thanks for clarifying. You're welcome, yeah. I don't know where we go from here, to be honest. Lads, I really don't. <laughs> That's it. Pod's um, over. It's like we get the counseling in nice and early, everybody. It's like homework is anonymous in here. Everybody admitting to all the habits that they do and all that kind of stuff. I tend to just work in, in clothing, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, you've been working from home. You guys have both been working from home a lot longer than I have. Thought I would love it, but I feed off of like human contact and talking, you know. And I just can't be alone all day. It's which is weird because everybody else else hates talking to you. Probably true, but so I'm I'm going crazy with this one too. Like like you said, I've been working from home for three years now, and before quarantine, you get off working from home and then you go do things and you interact with people. So it wasn't bad. It was actually pretty fantastic, but. Not anymore. Now it's like I get off and I'm facing the computer here and then I turn around and I face the TV there. Like it, mm. My life's been really boring lately. I didn't mind. Well, I've never minded working from home in particular, especially with like uh, running the site because it allows me to manage my hours a lot better, basically. So I can just do a couple of hours, have a little break, a couple of hours. And it's like, you know, plenty of places in the house where I feel comfortable working. I just need my laptop and away I go. And then like you say, I can just finish it whatever time and then go out and see people go down the pub whatever it might be and then got things on a weekend to look forward to like having Saturdays off to go watch Huddersfield and stuff absolutely great but now there is no escape from working environment I guess Mm -hmm. so it's difficult um but yeah I don't really want to get bogged down in the whole lockdown stuff um but as an update I guess actually we got a question so I'll, I'll throw this in here now um from Cello Boglo asks, now League A uh, has been cancelled. Do you think the same will happen to Syria? So yes. Liga and League Du, what's French for two? League Two, who cares? Yeah, League Two <laughs> uh, have both been cancelled. The rest of the season has been cancelled. They said they're not going to complete the schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, same with the Dutch League. La Liga seems to be heading that way as well. And Italy are still in limbo. Like they've got plans in place for maybe restarting training with a view to getting the season back underway. But given that Italy have been the hardest hit out of any of these countries, I wouldn't be surprised if they now take a look at it and say, "What's the point in honestly?" Yeah, I agree. I, th- I think I the think season was going to get cancelled, and kind of thought that for for a while now. You know, since the the beginning of the shutdown. But it, like you said, if all those other leagues that were hit less hard than than Italy. Are shutting down then it makes perfect sense that Italy would just follow suit I mean um, I know there were, were talks from like Latito for saying a, a well, one-off playoff game against Juve for the title which I could understand that given how close the table was there but um, yeah every, everything else besides that I don't see why we would restart you just can't do it though can you I as much as I love the idea of a one-off winner takes all Lazio v Juve Scudetto playoff and even if they are sort of within a game each other, of each other, so it makes sense, you can't have it in the history books that the 2019-20 season, the winner was decided by a one-off game. It just, there's no, I don't know, it just turns it into a whole separate thing then. And uh, I don't, I don't I mean, really like the No matter idea. how the season ends, there's a massive asterisk next to it, whether it's right. just a cancellation or, or a one-off thing. I mean, even if a title was given out, no one would take this title as serious as any other one, you know? So no, that's true. It's, um, it's almost like a, a pointless thing to do just for that reason alone, that, like, no one's going to 
everyone's going to be like, yeah, you won the title, but did you really win it? You know, like you right. won it after 26 games or whatever it may be, as opposed well, to – Well, I don't know if they don't – I, I don't know if they would award the title. Well, that, that's what the discussion was with Otito was doing that. But I think other, otherwise it's just going to be null and void like the other leagues. I mean, no, right. no title was given out for the other one. So. I think no. everyone's just waiting to see what happens in England. I, no exactly. one cares about anywhere else right now. Everyone's just like, well, Liverpool li-. – the only I people who want Liverpool else. to win are the Liverpool fans. The rest of the world doesn't want them to win. I think there's a, a big group of people that kind of think they deserve it. I mean, let's be fair – Wanting they them were to, going and saying they deserve it is two different things. Obviously, yeah, they fair do enough. deserve it, but um, but I don't want them. Some, to win. <laughs> yeah, some I don't want them to win shit. <laughs> oh yeah, um, I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right. A lot of people are looking at England, but I think England, the way that it is, and the money that's involved in it, England are looking at other places and saying, right, what what are other countries doing because then we can say, well, they did it when everybody else gets angry. Um, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. I, I think that. I think that once it becomes very, very clear that the two options are we cancel the season and then decide what happens with the, you know, the various awards, etc., or we play out the rest of the season behind closed doors. Once it becomes, you know, concretely clear that those are the only two options, then I think fans will start to think a little bit differently about it because at the moment a lot of people are saying, well. You know, you can't just write off the entire season and I need my fix of football. And I understand that, but it's, you know, you it can. becomes a, yeah, it just becomes such a different discussion if it's like, well, even if we did get football back underway, you wouldn't be able to go and see it. So, right. Well, you I could s- watch it on TV, which, not the same. That's the only way I ever watched it. I, you know, can't go to the games. That's true. Yeah. But even then, watching on TV with a, with an empty stadium, I mean, we saw that in our last game out, and it was not entertaining. It was weird. It was. It's strange. Yeah, it, no one wants to do that. It's interesting um, because it sounds like sort of what we would call non-league football, which is the fifth, sixth divisions downwards. They've um, cancelled all of the the fixtures, and as far as I know, they're looking at doing no promotions or relegations basically just restarting next season and of course there's a team about 30 minutes from me called York and they are saying if you rule that then we're coming straight at you with legal action because they're clear at the top of the table about to go back into the into the one below the football league so they're saying you know if you deny us what we think we were going to go on and earn then we'll see you in court basically and then it becomes a very messy thing because yeah. You know, they've already got a lot of clubs that they'll have to deal with who can't afford to get their way through this. That's mm-hmm. unfortunately And, and be I it, agree right? from from York's perspective. I mean, like if there is that clear ahead, like it's a foregone conclusion that they're getting promoted, then it's like they are getting jaded on that. You know, they're being shafted. But unfortunately, no matter how this ends, someone's going to be hurt, someone's gonna be upset, and uh, that's just life. Like life isn't fair. Shit yeah. happens. No one wanted well, the break to begin with. I think it's like it's so difficult to come up with a set of conditions where you say, okay, those two teams in that division go up, but the team that were third, who were a couple of points behind, have to stay down. There's no playoffs. Also. It's so much easier to just say nobody gets anything. Exactly. That That's the it. fairest way. It is. It is. And if that means leads don't go up, then get in. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was just trying to find out how far ahead York are. Um, just to see if they have any grounds. They're two points ahead, so it's like, you know, it's not even that clear a lead, but they're saying, we think we'd have done it, so don't deny us what would be quite a big financial thing more so than the prestige of playing in the league above. It's it's all about money Mm -hmm. at that level. They need. And I I wonder if that's like a settlement they could do is like just leave everything as is, but based Mm. on placement, give the award money still, you know? Mm. I mean, because yeah, then, then it's the leagues that are taking a hit and not, not the teams, but the leagues are the ones that will bounce back the easiest. And then the leagues as well will get their money to distribute from the FA above and they get the FA get their money from the government. So, like, mm-hmm. it should be a trickle-down theory, right. but I don't know if it's going to work that way. Um, and, and that's the way things should be right now is government should be helping out, but that's, you know, the sempre politics pod, so it doesn't matter. I do quite like the idea that, you know, normally if one country goes into economic crisis, they'll get bailed out by their friends. Like if we did, then you, you'd probably help us out and stuff. Mm-hmm. But then it's like, if everybody's fucked. Yeah, exactly. Then what happens then? then like the just, you just wipe it out. Like the money doesn't really, you know? 
It's, I mean, I've always said the world's economy needs a reset button hitting, but I didn't expect it to come like this. I, I didn't want it in my lifetime. <laughs> no. Right. Um, could be the end of the world as we know it, boys. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, we got an interview with Yong Hong Lee. Way to drop that bomb. Nice little segue. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk through it because there were some interesting points on there. We just wanted to prime it by saying um, thanks to Vito Angela, our uh, Milan-based correspondent, I guess would be the best way to put it, um, who, who got in touch with uh, Yong Hong himself, managed to secure the interview. And uh, yeah, we're really happy with how it turned out. You know, it was, it was good to get something like this on the site. And I mean, I couldn't believe it that we were typing in the headline that he's, you know, Yong Hong breaks his silence, basically. But it, that's exactly what it is. You know, he's, he said stuff on Twitter. He's quote tweeted um, a few of our tweets even um, that have, have made it into the bigger outlets. And, uh, you know, I'm just delighted that we've been able to bring this. And I think it's important to say as well, before we get into it, regardless of your thoughts on Yong Hong's ownership of the club or your thoughts of him as a person or the, the Rossonieri investment sport group that he represented, um, the interview was basically done as a with the purpose of giving him a, re- a right to reply to what Rocco Camiso said um, about him running Fiorentina in a much more responsible way. I do believe that everybody should be given the opportunity to tell their side of the story. So obviously with him interacting with us and stuff like that, I think it made sense to reach out to him and, and just say, look, here's your chance to, to set the record straight basically on, on everything that went on during your time in the club. So with that being said, let's dive into it. Um, Started with uh, a, a fairly straightforward question about um, his first derby being three years ago at San Siro, and it was uh, Zapata 97 with the last minute equaliser. Said that he gave his shirt to him as a as a welcome gift after the after the game. That instantly took me back to a weird moment in time, like that season for me. I don't know. It's like it's a strange one because that was the. 2016-17 season, correct? And then he yeah. took over not long after that, basically. I thought he took over like or had right he just bef- I think that over. game was his first in charge. Because they were calling it the Chinese derby. Yeah. Um, it's crazy but, how long ago that was. Know, it feels like just yesterday, but when you like reminisce, it feels like so long ago. It's strange. I remember being at the first derby of that season, which was also a 2-2 draw, and it was when Suso absolutely rinsed Miranda mm-hmm. um, on numerous occasions and scored a really good brace. And then they got lucky with a... There was a last-minute goal from Perisic where there was a header at the near post to the far post and he tapped it in with his back foot. And of course, what happened in the in the return game was Zapata basically doing exactly the same. Um, so the, it was an interesting symmetry. But that season, for me, just feels so weird now. Like, I don't, I don't know what... Yeah, I, I can't I remember. Were we in Europa League that season or was that the season we earned it? Uh, that was the season that we got back into Europe. That's right. Yeah. Because the so following everything was year really we got, that. I think, was with Olympiacos when they knocked us out in the last group of games. No, of it was Arsenal. Arsenal did it. We, no, we, Arsenal yeah. wasn't around at 16. That's what I'm 32. saying. Yeah. yeah. Well, we played Olympiacos in the group stage that season. And yeah, then and then we, we got, got knocked passed. out. Well, it no. was last season when we got last knocked, knocked out by Olympiacos. Knocked out. The one prior, we, we beat them in the group stage to lose to Arsenal in the round of 16. Oh. Or 32. Was it 32 or 16? 32. It was the first knockout round. Was it definitely? I thought it was yeah. the second. I don't know. I, I thought we. I know we didn't do good. No, at but I might be getting confused with whoever we played in the in the qualifier, and we absolutely dipped them for no apparent reason. Um, so it's bad. I mean, we should really know this. You would think it's just been so long since we've had any football. Huh, yeah. Yeah, so I remember the 2016-17 season, first of all. That was the one under Montella where um, we finished uh, fifth. And I thought it was a pretty good season. We played some good football that season. We lost to the teams that we should have. We beat Juve at home 1-0. That was the Locatelli goal. Had two good derbies. Um, It it was the round of 16. We had beat Ostersund, the Swedish team. That's it, yeah. And then we lost Arsenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Well, I'm wrong. What? Arsenal Sorry, made it to the semis that season also Athletic go wow so the, the season before 2017-18 obviously in the summer of 2017 while we're on the Young Hong thing was the summer that we spent a lot of money uh, yeah. over 200 million brought in names like Kessier, Conti Benucci, Andre Silva 
Barini, biggest name of all. Uh, yeah, Charnoglu, Ricardo Rodriguez. It was basically a full squad rebuild. Um, and I think a lot of people were really excited by yeah. the prospect of it because at this point, we didn't know that the money wasn't there to back it up. Right. Um, I mean, when the money's being spent, you assume that it's there. That's, I think, that's what, I mean, a logical say, I think thought process. Now is, is the best time to, um, to bring in the quote that you said as well as part of the interview. Um, in which Vito asked, you had a great great impact on our club. I'll point out as well that some people have misconstrued that as us saying great as in positive just means great as in a big the, impact. Uh, the size of the impact that you had was big. Um, and he gave a big budget for the first transfer market. Did he want any player in particular? And did he try for Cristiano Ronaldo like Mirabelli has come out and said? Um and Yong Hong says, as David Hanley said during his interview, the fans deserved better after a long silence in the market and in competitions. Wanted the fans to be happy again and tried to do what they deserved. But the transfer market is determined by many different things. There were many players we were considering, though I prefer not to go into detail about the specifics. Obviously, Cristiano is world class. Any coach would be happy to have him. My aim was to do the best by the team, the players and the management. So you could argue that he skirted around it there by, by saying... Uh, that really just wanted to bring in the best players and you know the financial repercussions were still kind of paying for at this point uh, with financial fair play and stuff like that. But he did come in and after years of being what feels like financially strangled towards the end of Berlusconi's ownership, where we didn't really bring in any big signings and like Bertolacci and Romagnoli were the headline signings of one particular mm-hmm. summer and it was it was different to go out and like, oh, by the way, surprise on the, towards the end of the summer transfer window, we've gone and signed on reputation the best defender in the league. There you go. Um, and Benucci, like, being unveiled with the shirt and stuff, we thought, wow, we're serious. I mean, I was thinking, we're going to be challenging for the league this year if these signings all gel. Um, and, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting summer. And it was one that actually brought all the optimism back, I think. But, you know, as I say, regardless of this idea that we didn't know at the time that it was sort of putting us in a precarious financial position um it was just nice to to um to see someone who came and wanted to spend money i guess and wanted to restore the club back to being front page news um you know he he does go on to mention that um he says, I know, I'm sure you know my views on Elliot management. I don't think that the firm saw or will ever see the club as I see it. Elliot has other motivations and its background speaks for itself. So, pretty, um, pretty strong comments, I think it would be fair to say. Um, but he's entitled to his opinion on that. And that was one comment in particular that I think angered a lot of people because they were saying your way of running the club was one that was financially irresponsible, whereas Elliot have inherited, you know, not the best financial situation and they're doing the best um, best that they can do with the situation. Um, but yeah, it, just bringing back so many memories of what a sort of turbulent year that was and then how sort of it felt to have a lot of investment and a lot of hype built and new players to kind of take over from the old guard. And I think, you know, it's funny that we've almost come full circle to now where there's only like three players remaining from that particular era. But I think it's interesting, whichever way you look at it, probably financially irresponsible is the way that that most people would look at it and would understand that. But um, for that one summer, we were back, we were back in the headlines for making big moves and it felt pretty good. It did. And I'd still argue that today that summer window was still critical to where we are now. I mean, Yes, like you said, most players are gone, but the ones that are still here are still pretty pivotal to our team. I mean, Chal Noglu's been utilized by every management since, whether you like him or not. Kessie has been a full-time starter. Look at Conti was and still kind of is. Um, you look at the Antonio Donnarumma's arrival was pivotal to having Donor, um, Gigi Donnarumma renew. So, I mean, a lot of things were necessary, and that kind of bounces back. It cut off a lot of the dead weight we had, and each new purchase from the Yong Hung era was an improvement it just so happens that we've improved upon that as well and it's just taking us to the next level and, and that's how you build something you know that's how projects begin you look at Tottenham Hotspur when they sold Gareth Bale they had all that money they bought a ton of new players and none of them are there anymore either but those players also, were helped build to where they are now 
screwed us in debt. Yeah, and no one's arguing that at all. But as far as our, our gaming ability, I think we improved because of it. I think so. I think what you we need to look from... at... Sorry, go ahead. I was just say, I think what's important to look at is perhaps in that 2017-18 season, that was the, the gelling and the coming together for, for this new core of players, all the signings that have been mentioned. And uh, then last season was the closest that we've been to cracking the top four. You know, it went down to the final game of the season and we were about 12 minutes away until Inter found that winner against uh, Empoli. I think it was Empoli. Um, and, and that was under Gattuso's management. So that was the closest that we've been to being back among Europe's elite in the Champions League. So as a second season, you can say that was pretty good. But the problem then is that so much changed at the level above. You know, we lost Gattuso. Leonardo went to the sporting director. Maldini got promoted to a new role. We had to bring in a new sporting director. We had a new CEO. Gazidis arrived from Arsenal. So we've never had the stability and I think if we had have done what Gattuso had asked in that, in that summer of, of 2019 to keep him around and say, OK, yeah, we're going to bring in two or three more experienced players like Ibrahimovic, Thiago Silva, Modric, Matic, whoever it might have been, that, that would have probably got us over the line rather than bumping us back a bit with another overhaul this time at management level and then obviously at ownership level as well. Um, that came back in 2018 when when Yong Hong lost control of the club to Elliot management. And there are interesting comments about how he thinks that Elliot are running the club at the moment, saying that um, they'll never run it quite in the same way that he did. And people, people took that one way and said, well, you ran it irresponsibly because you, you put us in, in shit with financial fair play. Um, but I also think what he means is they're not... I think what he's trying to say, I don't want to put words in his mouth, um, is that they're not running it for the love of the football club and for Milan being top of Europe again. They're running it from uh, the point of view they see it as a, as a business project. They see it as a, as, a, as a fun way to see if they can transform um, a, a club who are in dire straits financially and, and you know, try and get them back up there and sell us on for a profit. It's been widely reported that that is exactly what they want to do. And whether you think they're going about it the right way or not, um, it's where we are. And, and obviously, Yong Hong's entitled to his opinion. It's just two, two contrasting styles of ownership, um, I, I guess. And um, let's it, not forget that without financial fair play, the Yong Hong method is exactly how clubs like PSG and, and, and Man City rose to prominence. You know, right. it, It's not like this is a new strategy. It's just that you can't do it in today's world where you could have 10 years ago. I think if we had to have qualified for the Champions League, in that first season, 2017-18, when we finished uh, fifth and got into the Europa League. Or we might have finished sixth, actually. I can't remember. Whatever it was, we secured Europa League by beating Fiorentina at home last game of the season. Um, I think if we'd have somehow got into the Champions League that season, then it, it, we might be talking about a different story because all of a sudden the, the revenue from European competitions would jump up quite a lot. And then our spending with, because that's how FFP is calculated, is the amount that you spend um, as a percentage of the revenue that you generate. All of a sudden, we're not spending as high a percentage of our revenue. Therefore, you know, they might look at it more leniently and say, all right, yeah, you're fine. And that's how clubs get away with it. You know, PSG, Real Madrid, the reason that they get away with, with going out and signing a £100 million player or whatever every summer is because they earn enough money to be able to do that. And if they didn't, then... You know, like Man City have sort of been found out now because they've supposedly artificially altered some of the figures on their sponsorship agreements to say they're getting more money than they actually are. And people didn't understand why they do that. Well, that's exactly why they do that. Because it then means that in turn they can spend more on players. And money's not a problem for, for owners like that. And it's money's not a problem for Elliot. Elliot are not, you know, Elliot are an incredibly rich fund. Um, and they but they're also not in the business of pouring money out exactly. they're in the business of making money yeah. but i'm gonna play devil's advocate a little bit here and say that that summer hurt us because you guys say that those 11 players came in and made a difference when two of them two of the 11 are still here playing they are of those 11 <coughs> players they are were all on enormous contracts borini mm. was making two and a half million a year well earned yeah, well-earned. It was difficult to offload those 
players and we are still paying for it today with Biglia's contract, Chalnoglu's mm. contract. Chalnoglu produces a lot be behind the scenes, so he does do a lot, but think about if they would have done that a little bit smarter, you know, I, with I, a little bit more tactics. It would have worked out way better because the club is not in any better position now than they were four or five years ago. We're no, climbing, I think we, in, if we you, climb the if table you, two places. If you're judging it on where we finish in the table, I would totally agree with you. Um, I think we've also, you know, everything seems to be dictated essentially by sporting results as well. So as a result of us not being in the Champions League since 2014, our revenues have dropped through sponsorship agreements and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think overall the club is has not really moved forward in that period. And if anything, there's so much uncertainty around now that you could maybe say we've taken a step backwards. But one thing I will defend, <clears throat> you know, I don't want to defend Mirabelli. Um, for Sony, not to, you know, I, I don't really um, hold any grudges against him. But we signed the best defender in the league for 40 million euros because the opportunity arose and we couldn't have foreseen that he wouldn't be anywhere near as good as we expected. We signed Andrew Yeah, Silva but then what from... happened? He left a year later. He left, but then we got Matteo Caldara, and people were saying, all right, well, you know, this and is Iguain. a kid who's, who's... yeah." And Iguain was forced out of Juve. He didn't want to leave. That wasn't like a good move for, for us. It was a, it was a great move had... for us. It was one of the I best thought, strikers of, um, of the decade. Yeah. Plus, it, one He of scored the best like six goals. But at the, nobody knew what was going to happen. Exactly. At He's the time, looking back on it, you call but it a failure because of what happened. Yeah, but I mean, you didn't get get a bad haircut knowing it was going to be bad. You got a haircut because you thought it looked good, and then it turned out to be bad. Like it's the same thing. You you can't. Yeah, but you don't get a after you get a bad haircut, you don't go back and praise the guy who did it. Okay, I mean that's right. that's a solid analogy, yeah. But but it's it's <laughs> different with a football player. I mean, like he was consistently one of the best strikers of the last decade. Everyone knew who he was. We knew the situation with Bonucci was getting fucked regardless. Like it was a great deal to get Bonucci in, and then when he left, everyone was pissy because of how it was going down. It had nothing to do with the ownership. You know, the ownership no, wasn't saying get I'm rid of this guy. I'm not saying it was his fault. I mean, I guess I am saying it's his fault, but <laughs> right. I'm just saying regardless. When I like the move. Hook. When we made the move to get rid of Bonucci and bring in Iguain and Caldara, there was not a person on earth that said that was a bad call. Everyone was for it. I know you were for it. I remember. I was for it. All he was for it. I bought the fucking jersey. Like, we were all hyped. No one predicted Caldara would be a lame duck for three years. No one predicted Iguain would shit the bed for six months. I mean, it's just the way it went out, you know? Like, we've been fucked by a lot of bad luck just as much as we've been fucked by a lot of bad decisions. I think these were, I, th I think that's an important point. This was bad luck, not bad decisions. You know, how you much of it is luck and how much is it the people that they put in charge? I'd say because a club can't have bad luck for s six years. Well, I'm well we've had Lester four City. different managements in those six years. We've changed enough. Like you'd think that eventually the right pieces would be put together and, uh, and everything would be all right. But I guess the, the baseline of this, before we go off on an hour rant about who was right and who was wrong and everything, is that we made moves. We made moves that raised eyebrows, I guess. And like I say, you couldn't have foreseen that Benucci, who had been one of the best defenders in the league for the past, you know, what, seven years before that? The best in the world. People were saying he was the best at the time. And wanted to join us because he wanted to stay in Italy and it was important for his family that he was able to do so. And he seemed committed and he was the final piece. He was the icing on the, on the, on the cake of what we built in that summer. And everybody was really hyped. And we weren't to know that he would struggle uh, in a back four and without the two people next to him, you know. And then players like Andre Silva, who arrived and were tearing up the Europa League, but for some reason just couldn't buy a goal in Syria. You know, it took him ages to get that first Syria goal. And it's like, I don't, I don't know who to blame from all of that. Did we really pick a striker that half of Europe was after, win the race to sign him, and then he was rubbish, you know, just because he put on our shirt? Or like, I, I, I just don't know. I, do I, I guess some of who was in charge, I mean, like obviously Montella wasn't, a great coach and no one was excited for his anointment, just like no one was excited for Pioli's, but I think some people were excited about Jim Paolo in hindsight. I but. was, I wrote a feature about it. 
I, I wasn't too happy because I wanted the other stuff, but w- whatever, that doesn't matter. But you're right. I mean, like that plays a huge part into it. You can't have a developing young player become world class under a poor coach. You know, like they're not they're not going to develop the way they should if the coaching staff isn't where it needs to be. So that does play a big role. I mean, that's why you don't see guys like Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi going to to teams like Sheffield because like what are they going to do there you know like no offense to Sheffield it's just like that's the first name I could think of that wasn't a big deal <laughs> I think that's like <laughs> twice in three weeks you've gone in on the Sheffield United I assume you mean oh well, there is only one team in Sheffield of course it was Sheffield um, Wednesday yeah don't like them um yeah <laughs> I forgot all he actually watches like non-relevant football these are like te- whoa these are teams in, in my like league. Huddersfield yeah that's a big one Whatever. We've beaten, <laughs> I think we've beaten Man United more recently than Everton have, so. Probably I don't think more likely Everton than Everton beat Man United this season. No, I don't remember that one. Um, this season doesn't count. <laughs> this season's Norman yeah, Boyd. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, none of the results count. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of pieces put in place. I guess you can look at it one way or another. We certainly got close to the promised land, which was a return to Champions League. And then a year later, we were a point away. And you can say that we built from that car, Gattuso, in my opinion, anyway, did a did a decent job as head coach with with what he had. We added pieces. We added Paqueta. Um, we got back a Yoko in as as we know was very important to us. Uh, we signed Piontek, who started that first half of the season really really well for us. Um, so it was just a case of adding to the new foundation that had been built, and then like you know, of course it's all come crumbling down again because it's it's Milan, isn't it? Um, anyway, continue with the um, with the interview. Um, so he, he he says at this point, talking about Elliot and the way that the club's currently being run. Do you think it's right to let Ibra- players like Ibrahimovic and Bonaventura leave? And what do you think about Elliot? He says, "I'll just say this: Ibrahimovic is an excellent player who still gets results. Clearly, Gazidis is employing another strategy, but with regard to its usefulness, only time will tell. Gazidis has a tough task to carry out." I don't want to complicate it by saying what he's doing is right or wrong. Although looking at the results, it's clear to me that something ought to change. I think that's a really safe answer. That's uh, very safe. That's toeing the line. And I, to be honest, I wish we could have got a a little bit more, more edge out of him on that. Yeah. Yeah, Whether it's in support or, or against, you know, I just, I would like, I like more concrete answers than that, but I understand he's, he's not in a position to where he could really criticize. (laughs) You're right. <laughs> Coffee's <laughs> Coffee's gone down the wrong hole. Right, carry on. I'll be back in a second. Oh, well, Oliver's dead. He just choked on coffee. Um, yeah, I mean, God, what were we even talking about? That threw me off. He I always say, forget how tall Oliver is. Yeah, the man's a giraffe. My, his contact picture in my phone. Let me show you. We for for those listening, um, we've called Oliver giraffe neck for for years. And if you go to my phone, I'll block his number but you just see it's oh i didn't mean to call him but it's a giraffe neck is his picture of my phone all right sorry about that um sorry i actually just called you so just ignore that but it's like the strongest coffee i've ever made serious that yeah Um, don't you to be going to sleep soon why dad (laughs) (laughs) uh yeah, I can't well, remember right, what we were talking moving about. Moving on, oh, yeah. um, Camiso. Let's, let's, let's get, yeah, let's so the Camiso thing was interesting because there's been a little bit of a, oh, I'll call it a war of words, but um, Camiso obviously was linked with Bayern Milan at the time that it became apparent Yong Hong was struggling to, to pay back the loans that he'd taken out from Elliot to buy the club in the first place. And um, yeah, rumours that he made an offer that was deemed uh, insufficient. Um, and then he obviously went on to buy Fiorentina. And he's been, where's he gone? I don't know. I don't know. Um, Podcast is shambles. I um, didn't getting into things, so I wanted to make sure that he wasn't like eating something that's going to kill him. Oh yeah, that's always good. Um, so yeah, Camiso's been pretty vocal in the in the media, as I guess you would be as a as an American Italian businessman who owns an Italian football club. Um, but he came out and basically said that he's not going to run Fiorentina in the same way that Young Hong Lee did, leaving him in financial trouble. So. Sort of how this came about, it's like a right to reply to him. So here we go. What Camiso offered, this is Yong Hong speaking, not me. 
Uh, what Carissa offered was a joke and an insult to us, especially to such an important club as AC Milan, regardless of whatever, whatever he said in the press. Maybe he was misled by his advisors, who were potentially really arrogant and ignorant. We didn't want to waste our time when we had more important things to do and better offers to negotiate. So that's Rocco Camiso arguably put in his place. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't know what the offer was. Obviously, um, that wasn't revealed to us, but it sounds like it was, in in Young Hong's eyes, it was better to let the club go to Elliot than to Camiso. And if that's the case, then like that, what does that tell us about Camiso's offer? You know. Well, I mean, when it was happening, I remember thinking like, oh, this guy's an Italian. He knows the importance of AC Milan, but does he have the resources to make us what we want to be? You well, know? he also said called uh, Gigi Donamuja or something like that. But he, I mean, he didn't even know our star player's name and he wanted to buy the club that he supposedly right. was into. So, so, I don't know. I think that Young Hung was looking for an owner who he knew could give Milan the proper respect and uh, investment that they deserve. I, I, I also I, think a part of it was kind of maybe maybe deep-seated hope that Elliot wouldn't just take over that he could get an extension or, or there could have been ways right. to go through it. I think that was his main, main goal, but obviously that's not how it went. But I, I think that was more so what was going on than, than others. I get the impression that things pretty quickly turned sour in the talks between them, especially if Rocco went forward at first with an offer that was insulting. Um, and then it just became a case of, well, if I can't pay this money back, if I can't get an extension, all that, then um, it's better going to Elliot. You know, it, it's not really his choice at that point. If you can't pay the money back, then Elliot sees control by right. Um, but yeah, that, but when that's... Elliot sell the club, doesn't he get some portion of his money back? I don't know. That would have been a good question to um, ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I thought I read somewhere that he gets his initial investment back, but. Elliot only get the money that he got a loan for, if that makes sense, plus okay, all yeah. the profits. Yeah, I wouldn't even so, want to speculate on that kind of thing because oh, I get what you're saying. probably so, a dangerous track to go down. But um, I, th- I thought I read that when this all was going down. In my opinion, it would make sense because – It does make sense. They would get all the money owed back to them. Right. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, I think so. Um, but no, those were interesting comments, and uh, I haven't actually seen Camiso issue any kind of a response, really. So it'd be interesting to see if that comes. But um, fair play for for you know putting the record straight because Rocco may have looked like um, a bit of a an, an unsung hero in all of this. Like he was the guy who wanted to save us but wasn't given the opportunity to do so. But at least Young Hong's come out and said the offer in my eyes was insulting. Um, so yeah, that's fair. Um, I think those are the main points of the interview anyway. Um, it was a good one. If you haven't read it, then news tab exclusives, it's, it'll be there. Um, the, the first thing that you see, uh, it's worth worth reading through. And obviously we thank Yong Hong for his time. We thank Vito for compiling it. And um, yeah, hopefully the first of many exciting sort of uh, exclusive interviews that we can manage to get up on the site. And uh, I guess that's that. So... Right, solid let's, transition. Solid, yeah, pal. Is this your first podcast? Yeah, the second one today. <laughs> mm. uh. So we'll get on to questions in a minute. But I asked you before we started recording. I put out a, a graphic earlier. Oh, yeah. Um, Ooh. like it was a, a grid five by five of you know Milan players, and it was like a row of goalkeepers, row of defenders two rows of midfielders and a row of strikers. And it's like basically pick your five-a-side team. Um, so I'll read through it while you guys sort it out. But there was Dida, um, Rossi, Donnarumma, Abiati, Kudicini. And then the defenders, there was Costa Curta, Maldini, Nesta, uh, Cesare, Maldini, Franco Barese, Andrea Perlo, Sedorf, Rijkaard, Boban and Leardholm on the third row. Fourth row was Kaká, Hullet, Ronaldinho, Rivera and Savicevic. And finally... Inzaghi, Shevchenko, Van Basten, Weyer, or Nordau. So, AJ, what was your team? Yeah, this one was honestly like pretty easy, straightforward to me. I, I went um, Donnarumma, Nesta, Seydorf, Kaká, 
and Ben Baston. Um, I think that, well, it should be pretty obvious as to why, but Kaká is a Ballon d'Or winner. Ben Baston's a multi-time Ballon d'Or winner. Seydorf is the greatest midfielder of all time. Um, I chose Nesta over Maldini. I just think that Nesta would be better in a five-a-side. I think he could kind of cover a lot more ground as opposed to Maldini just I mean, obviously, Maldini's great, too. There's nothing negative to say about Maldini, but I feel like Ness is just more versatile on a five-a-side. And then Donnarumma, just because he's the, the youngest, he could leap further, and he's, he's uh, quick to react. And oh, so this is not in their prime? The it's, 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 it's the... Well, it is in their prime, but Donnarumma's still the youngest out of all the primes. I don't know. I think he's limber. better. Th- and plus, I, I've never really <laughs> been a big He's by yeah. far the biggest. I, I mean, uh, just looking at him, I've always thought Dita and Abiati weren't as good as we made him out to right. be. And were, I'd be lying if I said I, I, I watched the others, you know, so it is what it is. Kudachini was a weird one. It made me realize that we haven't actually had five world-class goalkeepers yeah. um, ever. Um, you probably have to go back to the 20s for like the, or the 60s, maybe. Uh, Maddie? Uh, Donnarumma, Barese, Sidorf, Kaká, and Weah. Way is an interesting one. I like the inclusion of George Weyer. Um Good player. Is it because his son's an American? I, it was really hard not to choose Ronaldinho over Kaká. Yeah. Because I love Ronaldinho, but I was like, when he was at the club, he didn't do shit. So why would I choose him? <laughs> Cash, you know? He's got the winner against Inter, but with his head. Um, yeah. That was kind of a mad one. But, but I agree um, with that. And that was kind of my thought process, too. I was, I was torn between you know, Kaká and Ronaldinho. See, I, obviously, you've touched on what I was going to say in that. Are we picking our five favorite players or what we think would were the five best players or what we think would be the most functional five-a-side team based on, you know, yeah. size and, and all yeah, that kind so of Yeah, so I made a last-minute switch between Maldini and Brazy because Brazy was a center defending mid and Maldini was an outside, you know. Um, no, I'm sorry, center back. Jesus yeah, Christ. I was <laughs> We're all looking at him like, hold on, British. I was like, why are they looking at me oh, like that? I mean, I know. Oh, man. I don't, I don't, I'm going to have to bring this up. I know. Did you see that 90 minute article where um, they did like a, this is the dream AC Milan squad for next oh, season? Oh, my God. They've given Matty Cash, Nottingham Forest, right back number three. Yeah. <laughs> and there was, there was getting rid of his number. Or Matty fucking Cash. Uh, yeah. There was someone else, too, on the list. I, I can't remember who it was, but it was just a, like, a number change. It was like an irrelevant player to the squad. Yeah. Like, this. My favorite was looking down. I was like, eh, oh, yeah, Belia. Belia's still here. Yeah. <laughs> we <decided> to- <laughs> We're going to renew him. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah that was funny. Uh, symbolic article. They, they, they did change it, to be fair to them, but I, I just found that quite funny. I like the premise of the article. I thought it was well written. But anyway, um, the correct answer for the goalkeeper is uh, Sebastiano Rossi. Um, I get the idea of Donnarumma being biggest and stuff, but I think Ross is the most nimble and he, he, he's probably the joint best shot stopper. Uh, incredible goalkeeper. You're um, wrong. Yeah, he's in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's all right, mate. That's why I'm I don't, what, what, when Now, you, you've had time to give your opinion. When so did I, Rossi retire? Uh, when did he play? Mid 90s. He played through the. Through the first sort of glory era yeah um 21 year career well good for him yeah i don't know i i just didn't i've never seen him play obviously so, so his that's why i chose daughter i was like i haven't seen many of the, i mean uh, i'm not gonna choose abiate at all because he was dog shit behind a great defense well, great 2002 so in terms of club honors sebastiano and rossi won about 12 and he's the only Hall of Fame member goalkeeper there as well. So, I know Dida probably is as well, to be fair. Um, defender, I'm going Nesta. No, I'm not. I'm going Maldini. That's silly. Uh, Maldini, because he's the versatility and the mobility of being able to play centre back, full back. I would always play. I think if Cafu was on that list, I'd have played Cafu because five. Which side, Maldini? From, uh, Paolo. Okay. Daniele. <laughs> Daniele. That's the uh, name, isn't it? Or is it just Daniel? Daniel. <laughs> oh, whatever. Um, after Daniel Radcliffe, apparently. Uh, <laughs> midfielder Clarence Sadoff, definitely. Yeah, just gotta go. We all shows him, I think. On, on a five-a-side pitch, Christ, his <laughs> foot would be absolutely lethal. He'd just be scoring from the halfway line every time, and he's still an incredible athlete. So I think he'd do a job even now. Playmaker, 
Kaká is the obvious choice, and I think it should be him. But to be different, I'll say Gianni Rivera because I think his footwork is probably the best alongside Ronaldinho out of anyone in there. But Savicevic deserves a shout as well. So he had an incredible shot on him and was a, was a good... T- They're all good players in there. Um, interesting, we've probably put Hull at bottom of the list because he's like, I guess, the most cumbersome out of all of them. But whatever. Uh, Shevchenko, then. I think you need a quick predatory striker in five aside. But if it wasn't him, I'd also go for Weyer because he's an absolute bully. So, yeah. That was, I thought that was quite a fun uh, fun little graphic. It's got a good interaction and all that kind of stuff. So, happy days. Ask a couple of questions and then we'll wrap up. Darren Torres asks, in a three-man midfield with Tonali and Ben Asser, who from the current squad or rumoured signings would you have as your third midfielder? So, this, I guess, is an implication that we go back to 4-3-3. Um, Bakayoko. Yeah, I don't know if he's a rumored signing, but I'm making that rumor now. Do you know what I find interesting is that Paqueta played his best in a three-man midfield as the one who was furthest forward. And I think if you've got Ben Asser and Tonali in there, those are the two that are going to break up the play. You don't need another combat midfielder like Bakayoko in there. Probably need someone a bit more creative. So I agree. it gives you the license to go out and get someone like Paqueta. Maybe, yeah, maybe throw him in, give him another chance, or maybe see... No, Have Kaká come out of retirement again. Again. Uh, David Silva. I wouldn't say no to Kaká. I wouldn't say no to David Silva. I like that idea, too. <laughs> I'm just trying to think. Like We've been linked with all kinds of midfielders recently. Um, I haven't kept up with them, honestly. I'd uh, be lying if I said I did, but... I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to go with Rodrigo De Paul. Rodrigo that would be a great one, actually. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah. I'll go with him. Yeah, I'll copy you. Uh, she could play, the, and then Benesse would be the left, and then Tonali. Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, Angelo Bonafini asks: Ranić, Emery, Spalletti, or Marcellino? Now there was an article that was published basically that said that those are the four candidates. Um, it's going to be one of them. I guess we should throw in stay with Pioli as well as, as an option in there. Um, I'm going to gonna... look at the tweet because you went through that very fast. Sorry, Ranić, Unai Emery, Luciano Spalletti, or Marcellino? I'm going with Ranić. Just because we've looked into it so many times. You know, we know so much about him. Yeah. I'm basically 99% convinced that that's how it's going to go anyways, that I can't just I, – I don't know. I can't go any other way. Yeah, my I will just fix it on that. Now. Yeah, I'll, I'll side with AJ on – this one but if we can't get him i would stick with pioli totally with you totally agree if we can't go for the guy who's gonna launch the project that we actually believe in let's maybe wait a year and Mm -hmm. and have a bit of continuity and hope that it that whoever it might be joins us when we're on a better footing i think that makes the most sense uh and i think really that's it have either of you seen the last dance Yes, I've watched the first four episodes, obviously. That's all that's out. But. Bjorn Krog asks what your thoughts are on it. I haven't seen it yet, but I, I'm, I've made I think it's it. fucking fantastic. I like, think Isaiah yeah. Thomas is a G. <laughs> I know, people are getting mad at Isaiah Thomas, but I was like, nah, like, that, that was cool, man. Fuck um, the Bulls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was a Bulls fan growing up just because that like, was Jordan's prime, and so I like that. But I don't really watch basketball, so I wouldn't consider myself a real fan. I got back into it when Derrick Rose appeared, and I was hyped on that shit too. And then, yo, he's still knees, here, baby. His still knees are tearing made out up of, in Detroit. They're made out of wet paper bags. It's, tearing up his. Yeah, Achilles. the only thing he's tearing is his ACL. His ACL, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's no, but awful. It, the episodes were fantastic. The first two episodes, like I, it, I viewed Jordan in a whole new light because obviously, you know, watching his, his twilight years when I was in my infancy, he, I think he, they, the. The show is about their sixth title win, which was the 97-98 season. For perspective, I was five years old. Like I, so when I started watching, it was past his prime. Um, mm-hmm. But this, this was really interesting to see. And it, I, it made me buy... You were five uh, years UK. old in 96? No, it's not about what I just said. It was the 97-98 season. So 98, I was five years old. I was born in 93. Oh, I was like, we're That's not the math. same age. Sucks. <laughs> uh but yeah, it was fantastic. Was... Maybe by the 2K game. Uh, I deleted it already because that game's ass, but I was really big on basketball for a day there. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Did you I buy it or of... was it free? It was free. <laughs> okay. I went through a weird thing of like, 
when I was growing up, the Bulls were the team because the legacy had carried over from the 90s, but there was also the, the Lakers who were huge. And then it just became the Miami Heat. Mm-hmm. The Miami Heat mm-hmm. became huge over here because obviously they had the... The, um, the big three. Yeah, the big three. You uh, can't not throw in the Spurs. Yeah. Because yeah, the Spurs have periodically won. Mm-hmm. The Spurs are just the most consistently good franchise in professional sports. I swear. They're just the in the playoffs every – no, because the Yankees have missed the playoffs in recent years, but the Spurs are there every time. Yeah. They may not win it every year or come close, no, but they're but, always in contention. Yeah. They're, 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 and Greg team. Popovich, what a man. Like, he's probably the best coach in NBA history. Um, uh, the Red Wings were that team in the NHL for 23 years. By the way, well, Madison, I want to attack you real quick because I saw you share, share some shit on Facebook about um, – the, the Pistons record against Michael Jordan and the good majority of those games were, were before Jordan had a good team. They were before the, the fucking era of uh, the coach. Why can't hey, I think of his name? What's the coach? It name? Jackson. doesn't matter. Like more he than half the losing those games record were, against the Pistons. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's I don't care not, about the team or not. It's, it's not, it's, it's a it's team just, sport. It's not a one person team, you know, then why are you making it about this one? Point? Or you're not. Me. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I just saw it and I was like, there's so many things I could say, but I saw it like a day late and I was like, it's not worth it. I don't even like basketball. I, whenever I post stuff, I try to trigger people. Yeah, you no, do not. every time. All right. Well, <laughs> good way I to end it. There. Good that we dedicated a 15 minute segment to the NBA. <laughs> um, Everton did not beat United this season. They tied 1 mm-hmm. 1 both times, but they lost to Sheffield United 2 0. You shouldn't even have mentioned it. Could have just let it be. That's yeah. pretty bad. Yeah. Well, I knew that they hadn't won this season, but anyway. Um, that's it, lads. Anything else to add? Any more shots to take at each other? Or? Nope, I'm good. good Ready stuff. to go eat dinner. Nothing. Yeah, good stuff. Um, right, yeah. Thank you for listening, everybody. Uh, I've been your host, Ollie Fish. You can find me on Twitter at Ollie Fisher or at Kilping Chronicle for some more explicit no one based rant. Being joined by Anthony Torgrude. That's me. Um, yeah. Thanks, oh, guys. Thanks for clearing that one out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm following on Twitter at Torgrude45. And we've guys... had Mad Dog Madison Darian Tosh with us. Is that my new name? Mad Dog. <laughs> Go ahead and follow me at Madison underscore DT. Remember, the Pistons have a winning record over the Michael Jordan Bulls. And it was just Michael Jordan. It's so, so good. It's yeah, a that's deep. True. Yeah, thank you for listening, everyone, and we'll catch you in a week's time. Tira Alessio, Suso, tira. Perché non tiriamo? Ma perché non tiriamo? Gol! Alessio Romagnoli, gol! Alessio Romagnoli!